Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I'm Dharma Sartero and I'm here with the 26th episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. This is the beginning of part two. And in part two, we're going to go into Bhikkhu Nyanananda's vortex theory and talk about how it explains the delusion of unenlightenment and ignorance, and also how it shows the way out to the attainment of Nibbana, the realization of Nibbana. So first, let's talk about the path. In the Buddha's teaching, there are four paths stream entry, once returner, non-returner, and arhant. So these are the levels of enlightenment or stages of deliverance in the Buddha's teaching. And as a person progresses through the teaching, he realizes these stages one after the other, often in rapid succession. So what are these four stages? Well, a stream entrant is a person who has entered the stream of the teaching. And just like a stream flows downhill and merges into a river and finally into the ocean. So a stream entrant, having merged into the stream of enlightenment, eventually reaches Nibbana after no more than seven lifetimes. So a stream entrant, the qualification of the stream entrant is that he has almost destroyed the first three fetters. And we'll get into what they are in a minute. After the stream entrant comes the once returner. The once returner comes back to this world only one time before his final enlightenment and liberation. What is the qualification of a once returner? He has almost destroyed the five lower fetters. Similarly, a non-returner has destroyed the five lower fetters completely and is working on the five higher fetters. And a non-returner goes directly to the pure land or the Brahma worlds where he attains final enlightenment there under the direct guidance of the Buddha. And finally, of course, an arhat has completely destroyed all the ten fetters and is free from them. So, what are the fetters? Well, the lower fetters are self-identity or identity view, doubt, a distorted grasp of rules and vows, sensual desire, and ill will. So, of course, identity view means I and mine, and also you and yours, them and theirs, and so on. Identity view is the idea that we are persons or souls, that we have a permanent fixed identity, and that we, even if we go to heaven or some other place after this life, we still retain the same personality and identity forever. Well, of course, <laughs> if we simply look at life objectively without bias, we can immediately reject that because we can see that our identity has changed over the few years that we've been on this world, from babyhood to childhood to adulthood to middle age to old age. The identity actually changes constantly. In fact, if we look in a very detailed way, we'll find that it changes many times a second. So this kind of self-observation weakens identity view because we can see that really <laughs> there's nothing at all permanent about who we are or who we think we are. But this habit of creating I and mine is so deeply embedded in us that it's very hard to give it up, even for a person who is meditating. So the second one is doubt. Doubt in the Buddha, doubt 
in the efficacy of the Eightfold Noble Path, uh, doubt in the reality of Nibbana or enlightenment, different kinds of doubt that can hold us back on the path. So when these doubts are weakened, the way it happens is by experience. We try the Buddha's teaching. We do some of the experiments in self-observation and we see, wow, the Buddha was right. That really is there. This really is going on inside. We really are just fabricating this I and mine. We may not be able to stop it right away. We may not be able to stop our attachment, our ignorance, our egotism, our possessiveness, and jealousy, anger, and so on. But at least we can see. And this is called cutting the root. We have to cut the root of self-view or identity view, personality view, to uproot the other fetters as well. So the first one that it uproots is doubt. Because we can see, how oh, actually, this Buddha's teaching is correct. No need to doubt. It does lead to the goal. Then, the distorted grasp of rules and vows is something that we see all the time, especially in religious people, even in religious Buddhism. Buddha Das Bhikkhu makes the observation, for example, that people come to the temple and they make all kinds of offerings, pujas and things like this, to the statue of the Buddha. And... I often want to ask them, who are you offering this to? And if they say the Buddha, I say, well, the Buddha attained complete unbinding 2,600 years ago. He's gone, gone, gone beyond, gone beyond, beyond. So how can the Buddha accept any offering? He hasn't been in existence for all this time. And Buddha Das Bhikkhu goes on to say, actually, these people are going to get the opposite result from their offering than what they're intending. What they're trying to do is to build up merit so that they go to some nice place in the next life. But actually what happens is that they simply reinforce this personality view and they project it on the Buddha as if the Buddha is living eternally somewhere in heaven. Well, there are Buddhist groups that believe this, that he is. But actually, the Buddha attained unbinding at the time of his Parinibbana. And unbinding means he is not. He's gone and without a trace. Nobody can observe where he's gone, how he is gone, or where he is. So for people to uh, get attached to rules and regulations in this way, it goes against the stream of enlightenment. It actually holds them back. Another of these five lower fetters is sensuality, lust. And of course, in all religious traditions, lust is condemned as being a hindrance, a fetter. Why is that? Well, because lust means to be attached to this body, to be attached to these senses. And of course, everybody likes to enjoy nice food, a nice soft bed, nice clothing, and so on. But to enjoy these things more than is required for maintaining good health in life simply holds us back because we're going to start to build up this identity view. I am the body. This body is me. This is myself. This is who I am. And that's ignorance because it leads to all kinds of other forms of ignorance and suffering. So this is the fourth fetter. And the fifth fetter is uh, ill will. If we're angry, if we're jealous, if we're upset with someone, if we're wishing someone unwell, <laughs> this is ill will. And so the practice of metta is given by the Buddha to overcome this ill will. We form intentions and thoughts of may all beings be happy, may all beings be at ease, 
May they be free from anxiety. May they attain the requisites of their life without struggle, without any problem. You see? And in that way, we overcome our ill wishes towards all the beings in the universe, which we may have been carrying for a very, very long time. These are the lower fetters. And the higher fetters are lust for form, lust for the formless, conceit, restlessness, and ignorance itself. So when all these fetters are overcome completely, that's our huntship. That's the highest stage of enlightenment. But until we get there, we have to go through these other path stages as well. So the path begins from where we form the intention to attain one of these states, either stream entry or once returner, non-returner, or arhat. And then when we actually attain those states, that's called the fruit of the path. So the path to stream entry is where we begin. And stream entry is the fruit that we're looking to get from that path. So let's talk about the stream entry. What are his qualifications? What are the four factors of stream entry that he possesses? One. Here, householder, the noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha thus. The Blessed One is an Arhant, perfectly enlightened, accomplished in true knowledge and conduct, fortunate, knower of the world, unsurpassed leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of devas and humans, the Enlightened One, the Blessed One. We could give a whole... Um, class, a whole video, just explaining this one, <laughs> because it's very deep. But again, this comes from experience. One tries the teaching of the Buddha. He tries the methods given by the Buddha. He tries observing himself in the ways explained by the Buddha, and he finds that they are true. So the path of the Buddha is not a path of will. It's not where we want to give up all these things and be austere and renounced and detached by an effort of will. No, that's not going to work. A little bit of will might be necessary in the beginning just to get us started. But once we advance even a little bit on the path of the Buddha, we can see these things for ourselves. We can observe within ourselves how they work, how they hold us back, how they keep us chained to this life of suffering, samsara, wandering around and around, life after life. So we naturally give them up. Anyway, this uh, description of the Buddha is found in many places in the suttas, and uh, I'm going to post a video that describes the deep meaning of this uh, Paragraph 2. He possesses confirmed confidence in the Dhamma, thus. The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable, to be personally experienced by the wise. So again, I'm going to post uh, a couple of videos that explain these deep paragraphs, these deep uh, stanzas, because they're quite uh, intricate and really they deserve a good explanation. Three, he possesses confirmed confidence in the Sangha. Thus, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is practicing the good way, practicing the straight way, practicing the true way, practicing the proper way, that is, the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. This Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of reverential salutation, the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. 
And again, instead of uh, using up our time here, I'm going to post a video explaining this stanza. And finally, four, he possesses the virtues dear to the noble ones, unbroken, untorn, unblemished, unmottled, freeing, praised by the wise, ungrasped, leading to concentration. And this last one is explaining the real meaning and purpose of austerities, ethics, morality, renunciation, and detachment. Because these things help lead us towards concentration. And the kind of concentration that it is leading us toward is also described in the suttas. A well-taught, noble disciple sees those states of feeling, perception, fabrications, and consciousness as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb, as a calamity, as an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as void, as not-self. He turns his mind away from those states and directs it toward the deathless element thus. This is peaceful. This is sublime. The stilling of all fabrications. The relinquishment of all acquisitions. The destruction of craving. Dispassion. Cessation. Nibbana. So again, we could spend actually many videos describing this uh, quote alone. And indeed, that's exactly what we're doing, because the last sentence, uh, the description of Nibbana, is the theme of this entire series, which will ultimately have 33 parts, and probably hundreds of videos, <laughs> all about Nibbana. So <laughs> Nibbana is the core, the root axiom of the Buddha's teaching. And once we understand Nibbana properly, then we can see the key to meditation is simply turning away from the world and turning within. And all the other rules, regulations, precepts, philosophy, uh, the whole system of the Buddha's teaching and practice is to support that. So, Right concentration is the highest stage, the eighth step of the Eightfold Path. But right view is the first step. And without the foundation of right view in the other stages of the path, then we can't attain this right concentration. But really, this is the essence of meditation. Normally, our minds are focused on the senses. Our attention is going out through the senses into the external world. And this has become such a habit that we're mostly ignorant of the world within. We don't even know ourselves, really. So when we sit down for meditation, many of the things we experience are surprising. Oh my goodness, my mind is full of so many thoughts. There's so many desires for this and that. I'm so stuck on this and I'm so attached to that. How am I ever going to attain even peace of mind, what to speak of enlightenment? Well, don't worry. <laughs> You're trying to overcome an ancient habit, a habit that's reinforced by the conditioning of life, the training we get in school and from our family and friends and everything around us is telling us, come out come out through the senses, enjoy the world, dominate the things around you, acquire the things around you, enjoy. Uh, and this is life. This is the picture of life we're presented. But what actually happens is nothing quite works out the way we plan. And there's suffering. And the main aspect of this suffering is the loss induced by change, isn't it? 
we get this idea that I need X. I want X. I gotta have X. X is mine. And we maybe work hard and we get X. But the thing is, the minute we get it, it begins to change. Huh? We get that new car, and then the minute we drive it off the new car dealer's lot, the value drops by half. <laughs> Isn't it? And then one of the day is going to break down, and finally it's going to become useless, and we have to sell it and get a new one. So why should we be attached to these things? Huh? Detachment doesn't mean that we have nothing or that we give up everything and just go sit in a cave in the woods. Detachment means that nothing owns us. Huh? It doesn't serve like an anchor that keeps us bound in the world. We're able to turn away from it and turn within and explore the unknown within ourselves. And believe me, there's a whole universe in there to explore. It takes time. It takes effort. And most of all, it takes consistent practice over a long period of time. And once we do that practice, then we begin to enjoy the fruits leading up to the realization of Nibbana. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta